the book of Exodus. And I'm going to show you here tonight from the scripture, from the Bible, why persecution comes upon the people of God from the leadership of a nation. Or how. We know that, and we're going to read, a, we're going to read another passage in a little bit in Psalm 105. In Psalm 105, the Bible is going to show us there, just so you know, that obviously we know that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We know that. Also, we know that uh, that God caused persecution to come upon His people in Israel. So understand this: that persecution comes upon the people of God because the people of God God needs to get our attention, and He uses persecution to get our attention. In the Book of Acts, God had told the disciples that they would take the gospel. The Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Where were they all at? They were all fixated on one area. They, not, they didn't want to leave Jerusalem. They were all stuck in Jerusalem. What did God do? He raised up a man named Saul, a persecutor of Christians, and he he put the he put run, he put fear in the heart of the people, and persecuted the people, scattered the people. And then what did God do? God saved the same man and used him to go to all those areas. To help organize churches in those areas. Look, you're, you're, it doesn't matter what the devil does or what the devil thinks he's doing. Ultimately, we know that God's providence prevails in this thing. Amen? Now, we talk about the providence of God. Understand this that God gives man a will, a free will. You can reject the Lord. But God gives you the opportunity to be saved. And, uh, the Bible says that for Moses, that Moses said, For the care of the Lord, we persuade men. Amen? And how do we persuade them? We persuade them with the word of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know this also, that God's not indebted and he's not the promise to give you multiple opportunities to be saved. You hear the gospel once, that might be the only time you hear the gospel. And it could well be. There's no guarantee that you're going to hear it over and over and over again. And that's kind of the attitude in America is, well, you know, there's churches everywhere. If I want to go to church, I'll go to a church. There's churches all over the place. I'll just go to any church. Right? First of all, not every church preaches the gospel. Right? You know? But I promise you this, as soon as we sit here, stand here tonight, the day is coming, and the day is come, when there will not be the number of churches that there are. That day will come. America is, is in the state of decline when it comes to Christianity. And much of what professes to be Christian in America today is not true Christianity. It's not God-fearing Christianity. And I'm going to show you the result of the, the human result of a Christianity in a nation or a people of God who do not have, first of all, themselves not have the fear of God, and second of all, they do not teach the fear of God. So, first of all, you and I, the believers, had better fear God. Second of all, our fear of God ought to compel us to speak to others and to warn others. Otherwise, persecution comes upon us quicker and heavier. I'll show you that to you tonight in Exodus chapter 1. Let's look at what the Bible says. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already. And how did Joseph get into Egypt? He was sold there by his brothers. Who ordained that? God did. We're going to read that here in Psalm 105. We're going to see that God sent Joseph ahead of his people to Egypt. And so uh, the Bible says, uh, if, if we continue to read, it says that uh, verse number 6, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, 
and waxed exceeding mightily. These are Bible words. Notice what it says. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And look, the Bible continues. And the land was filled with them. We're going to continue reading. We're not going to get sidetracked here. But there was by no means a dearth of people who would be recognized as God's people at that time in Egypt. There were plenty of Hebrews. There were plenty of people who were of the seed of Abraham. Plenty of them. The Bible says in verse number 8 though, now there rose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. That's very important. When this new king came along, this new pharaoh came along in Egypt who did not know Joseph, things changed dramatically. And we're going to see why they changed tonight. The Bible says in verse 9, He said unto his people, this is his, this is his logic, the logic of the king, the pharaoh in Egypt, who knew not Joseph, he saw these Hebrew people and he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. That was not a, that was not an educated guess. That was an honest evaluation. That was that was not an exaggeration. That was the estimation of the king of the pharaoh of the land. It was an honest admission. He said, "There's more of them than there are of us, and they are mightier than we are." Now, would you believe that? You all heard the story since you were little. You've heard the Sunday school. And you've seen, do you have you ever pictured the children of Israel as being more and mightier than the Egyptians? We they were slaves. How could they be slaves? How could they be slaves if there was more of them and mightier? Well, the Bible says that this new king didn't know Joseph. How could one man make such a difference? Why, why was Joseph so significant? And why, why did, up until this new king, why did they not think or consider dealing with this Hebrew problem? Why have they thought about doing something previously? Why did this man all of a sudden decide that this problem had to be taken care of? The Bible goes on. It says that uh, verse number 10, he said, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Isn't it interesting? He's going to operate according to wisdom. Man's wisdom or God's wisdom. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. What does God say about the wisdom of man? He said it's foolishness. The Bible says, it goes on. He says, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies, and fight against us, and so get them up our land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. The rulers of the land, the people of the land were grieved because of the children of Israel. Up until this time, what had Israel done to them? They had done nothing to them. But they feared that someday they might. The Bible says in verse number 13, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. And he said, When you do the office of the midwife and the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Think about that. He said to the midwives, the women responsible for birthing the babies, if it be a little boy baby, kill it. But if it's a 
little girl, you can let her live. That's wicked. This king, Pharaoh, gave this command without any hesitation, without any consideration, without any thought to it. That was his way to resolve the problem. This is the, this is the plan that the wicked, vile, godless Pharaoh comes up with. However, the Bible says in verse 17, very important, note this, but the midwives, what? Feared God. The midwives feared God. Why is there, why, why was there a Moses? Because the midwives feared God. How do you get the fear of God? One way, you're taught the fear of God. The Bible tells us, he said, to teach them the fear of the Lord. Right. Uh, a people must be taught. Everyone of you here tonight is over 50 years old and grew up. And you were taught the fear of the Lord right. in America. Everybody in America, growing up, primarily, was taught the fear of the Lord. Today, hardly anyone is taught the fear of the Lord. I'm not just talking about people who don't go to church, even in our churches, in our Sunday school, in our preaching services, from our pulpits. No one teaches the fear of the Lord. We have a nation today where literally, as was the model in the 1980s, no fear. We have a nation today in 2020, literally, where there is no fear of the Lord in America. No fear of the Lord. He said, but the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. You say, that's rebellion. No, that's the fear of God. You say, well, we ought to, we ought to, we ought, obey, we ought to obey the rules. Yeah, Romans 13 right there. If you, if those midwives had interpreted Romans 13 the way you interpret Romans 13, there would have been no Moses. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take Acts chapter uh, 5 over that philosophy. Amen? And let me just fly on Romans 13. Let me say to you, the Bible talks about the powers that be are ordained of God. Whenever that that's a that's a line. This is God right here, right here. This is powers that be delegated by God, and this is you down here. When these powers that be step out of line, and they're no longer under God, then you're no longer under those powers. You got to understand that. That's the key to that thing. And I mean, look, that's just the way it is. You say, well, they can still imprison you. So be it. That's that's. That just because they're a rebellious power, or I'm going to just use the terminology, a bastard power, an illegitimate power, just because they uh, are illegitimate, they can still have power and yield and grieve and persecute, but it's better to obey God rather than men. That's what the Bible says. We're going to read that in a minute, just so you know. So just don't think that, because honestly, if the powers of men come along and say, look, we don't want you to preach the Bible anymore, okay. We don't want you to meet in church. Okay. That's where that nonsense leads to. So, look, the powers of are ordained of God. When they fall out of line with God, they're no longer ordained of God. And you and I as believers are no longer to be subject underneath that power. Amen. Amen. We don't step over here and say, look, God, I'm still obeying. No, that's not what God. We obey God. Amen. He's our head. He's our power. This book right here is our Lord. We're to obey God. Amen. Now let's continue, though. The Bible says at verse number 18, and the kings and the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come into them. Some will say, Well, well they lie, they should have done that. Well, really, did they lie? They didn't lie. They told the truth. They just probably, I mean, they say that, that she's had a baby over there. It doesn't mean they got in a hurry. Amen. And the truth of the matter is, the, the uh, Hebrew women were hardened. They were slaves. And if you study any culture where you have women that work in the fields and so forth, They'll deliver a baby and keep on working in the round field. They don't even slow down. I mean, it's not like, you know, there's no such thing as bed rest. Amen? I mean, they just, uh, I mean, it's just the way it is. And and that's what they were saying. They 
Jesus said, our women are, excuse the word, are soft and pampered, and they have to have help. These Hebrew women, they, they pop the babies out and just keep on going. I mean, they're, they're strong and tired, and, and so we can't get there in time to do anything about it. So they weren't lying. They weren't lying. The Bible says, and the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in to them. Therefore, verse 20, look at it. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied, and wives very mighty. Who did God deal, deal well with? Why? Because they feared him. And look at the next verse. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Anybody ever study that verse before? You, you, add, you look and you try to look at what this guy thought. No, no, everybody can compound it all about that. And honestly, I believe it says this. The word house was also likened to a web. It was a protection. God simply made pavilions or a place to protect the midwives. He made them places where the king of Pharaoh couldn't get to them. Yeah. Listen, you study the life of Ezekiel. You study the life of Isaiah. You study the life of all the prophets of God and Elijah. Didn't matter. Listen, if those men feared God, and they didn't fear the wicked kings, and they stood up, and they put their finger underneath the, uh, the nose of the wicked king, and said, Thus saith the Lord, God always takes care of this man. Amen. So why did he take care of John the Baptist? Yeah, he did. Amen? I mean, listen, it was God. Hey, I, I don't think John the Baptist would have chosen to leave this world any other way. But when someday when I get to heaven, I don't think John the Baptist will be walking around and right carrying his hand along with it and say, man, I wish God had to know. He's got, he's got his hand back on his shoulders. Amen? And he, listen, he's a hero of the faith. Why? Because he said to the king, it's not lawful for you to have her. I'll tell you what, give me that over all the soft-soaking uh, pink tea lemonade pipsqueaks that will not take a stand on this work right Amen. God has commissioned us as his people to do one thing, one thing, one thing only, and that is to stand on the word of God. That is our duty. That is our commission from God. You say, but what will men think? The Bible says it's better to obey God. It's better to obey God, amen, than to fear of man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. To obey God, it is to obey God is what we're to do as believers. Those midwives fear God. Why do they fear God? Because they've been taught to fear of God. It had been handed down to them. Listen, someone had instructed them in the fact that it's not lawful to take the life of a little baby. But listen, be good if someone has instructed America that it's not lawful to take the life of a little baby. Don't applaud, and we ought not to applaud, uh, the idea of limiting late-term abortions. The truth of the matter is, it's wicked and vile, and we need some people to stand up and say it, that the murder of the innocent, that the murder of unborn babies is a wicked, vile abomination before God. Right? Amen. And why do you say that? Because the Bible says it. Amen. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's an issue where the men of God are standing in the pulpits and lift up their voices and cry against it. You say, well, what would be the answer to all of the abortions? Well, if the same men of God would stand up and preach that you don't have sex outside of marriage. Amen. Hey, listen, our marriage is honor at all. And the men and the foul, the golfers and whoremongers, God will judge. But they say, but preacher, that's not popular preaching. If you preach like that, people won't come. Well, but listen, if we preach like that, God will come. Amen. Hey, God. God will say amen to the preaching. Why? Because God's looking for men and women and boys and girls that will lift up his book and say, I stand where the Bible stands. Amen. The reason why this country doesn't respect us anymore, the reason why this country doesn't fear us anymore is because we don't fear God. When we lose the fear of God, we lose the respect of man. Right. Now, we're not trying to get man's respect. But men... Wicked people, the devil himself. What did he do when he saw Jesus? What did he do? He said, Will thou persecute me before the time, by my time? You got men today that won't even preach that there's a hell. You know what the devil was doing when he came and fell before Jesus? He said, Are you going to cast me into the pit now? Study it out. The devil knows he's doomed to hell. He's going to do everything he can to turn away the hearts of men. He knows he has but a short time. He knows he has some influence. And he tries to persuade men and turn men from God. Why? Because he knows he's going to hell. And he wants to take everybody he can with 
and, and he wants to destroy God's people and the influence of God's people. He can't take you to hell. Right? But he can take away our effectiveness. And we are no more effective as what we are when we fear the Lord. And if we don't fear the Lord, how are we going to teach the fear of the Lord? The average church today, there's no fear of the Lord. There's no fear of God. It's not what thus saith the Lord. It's what the deacons think. It's what the deacons' wives think. What's the board members think? Who cares what the board members think? Who cares what the deacons think? Who cares what the preacher think? It's the word of God. It's our authority. And we're going to preach the word of God and declare God's truth. And that's it. So what if it's not popular? It never has been popular. Amen. But God is looking for a people who fear him. These women, they said, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them. Think about that. The midwives. And we, we have two names, and I'm assuming they had assistants, people that worked under them. But we have two names, so they must have been the leaders. And all throughout this chapter, it says that the people were covering the land, and there, there were all these Hebrews, and all those, but yet two midwife ladies had enough fear of God or guts to refuse the king. That king was afraid of the people, but he had nothing to be afraid of because they had no leadership. They didn't know God. Not only did Pharaoh not know God, the people didn't know God. Now the truth of the matter is, well, let's, let's look at the Psalm 105, if you would. If you want to read Acts chapter 5, verse 17 through 42, help yourself. And that in Acts chapter 5, that's when they call uh, Peter in and the disciples in and say, look, we command you not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. And he said to him, look, whether it be right to obey God or man, you decide. He said, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, we're going to keep on preaching in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hey, they whipped them, sent them home, and they went home rejoicing and went and told the other disciples, hey, guess what? They just beat us for preaching Jesus and revival started. Amen. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that persecution doesn't help the people of God. It does. But I'm going to tell you why persecution comes to the people of God. In the, in the New Testament doctrine, in that era, it came because the people didn't know God. But here it came because the people who knew God didn't fear God. Let's look at in Psalm 105. You say, well, they didn't, no, no one taught them the fear of God. Well, that's not true. Let's look at Psalm 105. First of all, we, knew, we know that the children of Israel have been taught the fear of God. We know that they have been trained. Abraham, then Isaac, Then Jacob, they had been taught and trained. Joseph taught them. They knew to fear God. But it all had gone out the window. When, when you just study the story, when Moses showed up with his rod and Aaron, you know his first commission was to convince the elders of Israel to believe in God. We don't have time to do that. We'll look at that another time. But listen, they didn't go there, first of all. God didn't say to Moses, go there and convince Pharaoh. He said, go there and convince my people. And so Moses had to get the elders of Israel aside and convince them and get them to believe God. And then he went to Pharaoh. Why? Because the elders of Israel had lost the fear of the Lord. Do you know, I was, before we read there, in 2019, last year, 65% of adults in America profess to be Christian. Now we know that's an illegitimate number. But can I tell you what the number was in 1990? It was 85% in 1990. But yet, all we have done in my lifetime, all I have seen is the loss of Christian liberty. All I have seen and all of you have seen is America moving not slowly away from God, but rapidly away from God. Who would have thought in our lifetime you would see uh, the nation uh, uh, commemorate and, and, and embrace 
sovereignty like it has now. The leading candidate, the Democrat Party, is an open sodomite. Yep. He's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. And I'm not going to say his name because I might say it the way I think. So anyway, listen, I just put this up. And, and, and it's just insane. It's insane. The whole party. And look, and you look on the Republican side, and it's the same thing. The Republicans and the Democrats both have embraced sodomy. They've embraced the LGBTQ lifestyle. No, no politicians are willing to stand up and oppose it. Most Christians won't oppose it. Most Christians support that, and, and they've got into our schools. They brainwash our children into most children. If they hear you talk about sodomy, it's like what we felt and what we were taught when we heard people talk about saying the N word growing up. Amen. You know, listen, we were taught not to say uh, uh, words about people of color, and nowadays, and uh, nowadays, if you say anything about someone being a queer or sodomite, you're reputed in the eyes of your children. Your grandchildren will think you're mean and you're hateful. Why? Because America has lost the fear of God, and we don't have the men of God to stand and preach the word. Of God. Can I tell you something? It's not about being hateful. Yeah. I can preach the word of God and not be one bit hateful. Yeah. It's the truth. It's about being the truth, preaching the truth. Amen. Yeah. It breaks my heart. It confounds my mind. That's not a hard thing to do, but it confounds my mind to imagine how we got to where we are. Even at the rate even if, even if it were so, even at 65%, let's change that. If there were 40% of Americans that profess to be Christian, I mean genuine, if there were 30%, if 10% of the people in this nation fear God, I believe this book right here, I don't think it would be the head of correction of these. That sounds strange, but like what they were looking for in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Exactly. You say, was there no one in Sodom to teach the people to fear the Lord? Yeah, there was a man there, but you know why he didn't teach them to fear the Lord? Because he didn't fear God. So how do you know he didn't fear God? Because if he feared God, he would have been down there associating with the men of the city and the gay of his men. I was we talked a few minutes ago before the service. The number one, the number one way to see if a preacher ruin his testimony is from getting politics. I'm going to say that it needs to be said. God didn't ordain; He didn't call preachers to run political office. He called preachers to stand up in the pulpit and preach the word of God. That's what we need: is the men of God that preach the word of God. I'm not going to affect anything over there in some legislative branch. I'm weary of independent Baptists uh, applauding preachers jumping into the political realm. God help us. If you're not a preacher and you want to run for politics, but if you're a preacher, stay out of that mess. You preach the word of God. Amen. You let go. Years ago, I was in the house preaching a sermon. He said he'd gone off into a, into a restaurant. He said he sat down there and the, and the waitress handed him a, a menu. And he said, man, I'm sorry. I can't see this. I can't see it. I, my eyes, I, it's too dark in here. He said, I need a flashlight or something. And she said, don't you worry about it. She said, you sit there a little while. She said, you'll be able to read it. And he said, I noticed that she was right. He said, the longer I sat there, the more my eyes adjusted to the dark. And for long, I could read the menu. You know, that's what happens whenever you get into politics before long. So I, look, I know it's popular. I've got a lot of us all the time coming. We've got a bunch of crusaders going to change America on politics. So I'm just going to go ahead and go on record and say the way you're going to change America is by preaching this book right here. And standing the word of God. And declaring the word of God. Right. You can't preach and teach like this in the political realm. They're running you out. You won't win an election if you stand for the word of God. That's right. You know why? Because America does, does not fear God. America hates the word of God. Most Christians hate the truth of God's word. I mean, Bible believing Christians or professing Christians hate the truth of the word of God. They despise it. I started preaching my own tithing. The first thing God taught his people was to take a tenth of the ephah, an ephah, which was a tenth of the unleavened bread, and put it aside. The first thing I, we've got a generation today that teaches against tithing, says it's optional. I'm going to tell you what, if you don't tithe, you don't fear God. That's not the message tonight, but I'll get that later on. I don't care. You tell us, oh, where, where's the New Testament economy? You can be in any economy you want to be. You can be anywhere, but, but my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't tithe for you or for anybody else, but I tithe because I fear God. That's all I'm right. I'm not bragging. Yeah. There's nothing to brag about. I didn't give the Lord anything. That's it. Amen. No. In Malachi, he didn't call a person that didn't tie. He didn't call him a thief. He called him a robber. No. A thief is somebody.
somebody that sneaks into your house and takes something that belongs to you when you're not looking. A robber is someone who strong arms you, comes to you and forcefully takes it away from you. And God said, will a man not feed from God, but will a man rob God? Yep. Brother, listen, we better fear the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's just a fact. Isn't that? I'm not, look, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to build up any kind of a budget or anything else here. I just, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to be a part of a church where the people don't fear God. Amen. Amen. Because without the fear of the Lord, we're going to tank anyway. Yeah. That's the reason why our nation is tanking because there's no fear of the Lord. Where Where does the fear of the Lord come from? Well, let's look at it. What I think is Psalm 105. Is that right? That's where I'm at here. Look at it. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known his deeds among the people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Sing unto him. We ought to be doing that. Amen. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. We ought to be singing in the Lord. We ought to be talking about him. We ought to be telling people how wonderful he is. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his Strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. That means this. It means that we're at, that we're not to diminish the judgments of God, but we're to glory, we're to glory in the judgments of God. All oh, the generations that don't don't judge. You know what? I don't have to. I don't have to. God's already judged it. I don't have to judge it. Amen. You're the one judging it. Hey, they're the ones that are judging it. They're the ones that are sitting and they're taking the word of God and putting the word of God in the microscope and saying, well, I don't think this is what it meant. You're judging God's word. Tell me not to judge. No, I'm not judging. I just go over the book says. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you won't have to be judged by others. You know how you judge yourself? Because we've got to judge right here. The word of God. He said now, verse 6, O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. You know how his judgments get to be in all the earth? Because his people convey them there. And that's our duty. You say, well, we're just supposed to love people, okay? True. But we're, if we love people, we're going to remind people of the judgments of God. If I love my children, I'm going to teach them that God has not changed his mind about sin. That God has placed definite judgments upon sin. The wage of sin is death. No one will ever love anyone more than to remind them that the wage of sin is death. You know who judges so? God is. And if that judgment of God is important, then all the judgments of God are important. Right. Amen? Who are we to decide what judgments of God pertain to this generation? They all do. Look what he said. Verse 7. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. Who was Abraham? Remember this. Do you remember anything else? Abraham obeyed God. Why? Because Abraham feared God. Abraham feared the Lord. How do you know he feared him? Because he obeyed him. And if you and I fear God, you know how we know that we fear, that we fear God? If we obey him. Amen? The Bible says, verse 9, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. When they were but a few men in number, yea, very few had strengthened them. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine of the land. He brake the whole staff of bread, 
He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Was there anything that anyone could do with the children of Israel so long as they feared God? Remember the story of Balaam quickly? Uh, the king called him Balaam. He said, I want you to curse these people. Balaam went out to do it, but there's a lot of money involved in it for him. If he could do it, God said, no, I'm going to curse him. You're going to bless him. And that happened again and again. And listen, and so finally Balaam said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you want to hurt these people, he said, send your daughters over there. And let them seduce their boys. And they'll want to get together and marry. And he said, that'll bring the wrath of God upon them. He said, I can't curse them. You can't curse them. He said, but God won't fail to fulfill his word. And God will deal with them. And God will weaken them. He'll, he'll diminish them. You know what, Balaam? That's called the doctrine. The doctrine of Balaam. You know that didn't die when Balaam died? No. It's still what's going on today. You know the Nicolaitans, you know what they were? They were a group of people that hated the New Testament church so much that they said there's no law that applies that Nicolaitan, Nico was an actual, he was a deacon in the church. He said, look, let's just live any way we want to. You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to weaken the church. And here's what he did. He put aside God's law. And when the church became weak, he couldn't create his own law. That's what communism is. That's what socialism is. That's what leadership of man is. You get away with the fear of God so that man can become the governor of man. That's why America is embracing communism today. It's yeah. because there was a time when we didn't, you know what? You didn't have to have 7,000 policemen roaming your neighborhood because people had instilled in them from their birth the fear of the Lord. You don't do that. God's watching you. You all know what I'm talking about. You grew up. Some of you grew up and you knew it. And even younger of us here, we knew it. We knew the fear of the Lord. We were taught by our parents, you can't do this. You can't do this. But this generation today is a lawless generation. There is no fear of God. There is no God. So, what do we need? We need more government. We need more restrictions. We need more police. We need more laws. So man's not trying, the devil's not trying to liberate us by getting us to let loose the fear of God. He's trying to tighten the chain and forge the chain tighter around our neck, and that's exactly what's happening. So it goes on. Let's continue to look at it. For Psalm 105, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Who sent him there? God did. Whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. You know what that means? It means God tested Joseph to see if he was for real or not. Would Joseph fear God? Remember the story of Job? What was Job? Job was tested. Gave this Job, the devil said, Does Job fear God for not? He said, Touch him. He said, Let me touch him. He said, Touch him and he'll curse you. You know what? You know why God tries us? To see if we fear him or not. See if we believe him. Will thou go away also? Jesus said to his disciples. They said, Where will we go? Thou hast the words of life. Amen. Look what it says. Let's get down toward the end here. The king sent and loosed him, even the roar of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance. Now, verse 22. To bind his princes at his pleasure. Now look at this verse. And teach his senators wisdom. You see that? In Egypt there were no, there was not a senate, they were aged men, leaders. You know who was commissioned by the Pharaoh to teach the men? Joseph. He taught them wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord. So when Joseph died and there rose up a king who knew not Joseph, meaning this, meaning there rose a Pharaoh who knew not God. He had no reason to fear the Lord. Turn back to Exodus chapter 5. Now Moses is going into the kingdom. Moses has gone into Egypt. Let's 
see what the attitude is. And afterward, in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, but well, I'll do it. And they, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. Who's the Lord? Why should I fear him? Why should I care about him? Can I say tonight that that's exactly where America is today? You know whose fault it is? It's, it's our fault. It's our fault. Why? There was one Joseph taught the entire nation of Egypt to fear the Lord. But we don't have enough Christians in America to stand up and teach fear the Lord. You know why our politicians don't fear the Lord? Because God's people don't fear the Lord. You know why God's people don't fear the Lord? Because God's men in the pulpits don't fear the Lord. You know why we don't fear the Lord? Because we don't believe this book right here. Go back to Psalm 105. I'm going to finish reading it. You're, you're going to be hard pressed to find a church, to find a preacher. Find Christian homes in America tonight where the fear of the Lord is prevalent. It's just, it's just not there. It's just not there. Psalm 105 continues. We're done. I'm going to finish here. Verse 20. The king sent and loosed him, even the rulers of the people, and they let him go free, he made him lord of his house and ruler over all his substance. To bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you why Joseph didn't mess with Potiphar? It wasn't because he had a low drive. It's because he feared God. It wasn't because he feared Potiphar. He could have had his way and covered it up, and Potiphar would have not known. But Joseph knew that there was a he was in the house alone. And the Bible says alone, he was alone. He knew there was a God in heaven that could see it. You know, you know why? You know why there's such a problem today in our Christians and our pulpits and our churches of perversion and preachers that are falling by the wayside because they don't fear the Lord. You know, I've said this before time again, I think I'll throw it in here. My dad worked with boilermakers, construction jobs, worked away from home, worked in places where the women were would throw themselves in. And my dad told me, he said, I've left jobs before. I've, I've left jobs and walked away from jobs. I've quit going in restaurants before. No, hey, he, hey, and why? Because he was true to his marriage vows. Hey, as a boilermaker. Why? Because he feared the Lord. Amen. And his wife. Yep. Amen. <laughs> She's still mad. I see every time I get that illustration, he gets mad. Well, because he shouldn't even have told me that. Well, he told me because he was being an honest, good man, and he was instructing his son. Amen. And listen, and it's the truth. Yep. It's the truth. Why can't I do that? No one will know. Why can't I? Because I fear the Lord. That's why. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, you've got preachers today all over the place, right in their own, right in their own parking lot, in their own church office. Yep. You know why? They don't fear God. That's why. How can you trust him if you don't fear him? How can you live for him if you don't fear him? It's real simple. You know who God cares for? You know who God blesses? You know who God? Then they that fear the Lord take off from one to another. The Lord hearts and heard and a book of remembrance is written before him for them to fear the Lord and to thought upon his name. And we're going to get to Malachi 3.16. But that's a, that's a gem of words right there. Amen. We'll get to this thing. And we're talking about who, who is the blessed of the Lord? Who are the people of God? You go all through the Bible and see there's a remnant of people who what? Fear the Lord. And they teach their children to fear the Lord. And they teach those people around them to fear the Lord. Let's look here. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should trust him? That I should obey him. Verse 23 Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Boy, that, that's an oddity. We don't have time to get into that. 
that Han Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. That's not an accident that God worded it that way. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. Did they know they were stronger than their enemies? Now Pharaoh has said they were stronger than him. Now God has said they were stronger than him. But who were the slaves? Who were under the taskmasters? Why? They had no fear of God. Who, who was given houses and special privileges and taken care of? The midwife. Why? Because they feared the Lord. Isn't that complicated? This is almost, you know, when I read the Bible and people say, well, it's hard to understand. But you know what? It feels like, it feels like I'm saying, what's two plus two? It's not that hard to understand. It just is hard for us to obey because we're wicked, I reckon. The Bible says he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal suddenly with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. He freed this from a little bit further. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. Their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. He spake, and their king divers sorts of flies and lice in all their coasts, and gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He smote their vines also and their fig trees and brake their trees and their coasts. He spake, and the locusts came, and caterpillars, and that without number. And he did eat up all the herbs in their land and devoured the fruit of the ground. He smote also all the firstborn in their land, the chief of all their strength. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of the Lord fell upon them. The next time, there's a story in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when Samuel was praying. He called a prayer meeting, and the Philistines heard about it, and they said, this would be a good time to go down there and whip the people of God. They're down there having a prayer meeting. They didn't know it was a prayer meeting. They found out that's a bad time to attack the people of God when they're having a prayer meeting. Amen? If God's people will get right with God, how do you, what do you mean get right with God? I mean get right with this book right here. And how do you know if you're right with this book right here? When you trust the Lord, when you obey the Lord, when you fear the Lord. Can I tell you something real quick? I'm done. You know those Hebrew midwives? Those, uh, I'm assuming they're Hebrew. Those midwives? Do you know that the law had not been given yet on the mount. Moses had not been given the law. They had not been told, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. Why, well, why did they do it? Because it had been passed down from the book of Genesis from before the flood. Someone had taught them. They knew the story of Cain and Abel. He used to shed a man's blood. They knew the truth. So, I'll say this. Tonight, people know the truth. The murderer, the abortionist, the sodomite, they know the truth. Still. And there's some reprobate in their mind they can't comprehend the truth. But, they, but, but this, this group today, and, and that's why they're in the condition they're in, because they're reprobate. But understand this. They know the truth. They know when they start down that road, they know it's wrong. There is a generation coming that won't even know it's wrong. It's just getting commonplace. But today they know it's wrong, but they do it anyway. Because they don't see in us an example of fearing the Lord or obedience. It's called hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? It's operating as a believer without the fear of the Lord. Amen. Understand that. I hope we get that tonight. Very important stuff. Amen. Someone else? I'm done.